Hello, and welcome to the 62nd Annual Delta Exhibition. My name is Dr. Victoria Ramirez, and I'm the Executive Director of the Arkansas Art Center. I'm thrilled to share that this year we received high participation from artists in the show, and 772 works of art were submitted by 348 artists representing 14 states. What's probably most notable about this year is that we are online. And I'm thrilled that we not only have the exhibition available for you online, but all of our programming, including future artist talks and studio visits, and tonight's award ceremony will all be available online. We encourage you to visit the exhibition often and share it with friends and family. As in other years, Lots of people work to make this exhibition and this year's Delta a success. And I must thank our sponsors for their continued support in this program. Mrs. Lisa Ann Rockefeller, Terry and Chuck Irwin, Judy Fletcher in memory of John R. Fletcher, Friday Eldridge Clark Law Firm, J.C. Thompson Trust, Diane and Bobby Tucker, the AAC Contemporaries, Bank OZK, Phyllis and Michael Barrier, East Harding Construction, Marion Folk, Barbara House, Don Tilton, the Andre Simon Memorial Trust, in memory of everyone who has died of acquired immune deficiency syndrome, and the grand award is supported by the John William Lynn Endowment Fund. All of these people support this program because they believe in its importance and they want to support regional artists. Let me also thank our collaborative partners who enthusiastically agreed to serve as hosts for this year's exhibition. Historic Arkansas Museum, Thea Foundation, Akansa Gallery, and the Argenta branch of the William F. Lehman Library in North Little Rock. As many of you may know, the Arkansas Art Center is in the midst of a major construction project with a brand new building opening in 2022. These community partners agreed to step in and host the Delta exhibition this year. And we're grateful, even though we shifted online, we're grateful that they were willing to give us their gallery and wall space and work with us on this important exhibition. We're so honored to be a part of the Central Arkansas community. It's truly a community that supports the arts and believes that the arts is an important part of quality of life for everybody. And with that, I am really delighted to introduce the mayor of Little Rock, Frank Scott. From the day that I met Mayor Scott, he has shown his support of the arts, whether it's his affinity for film, or visual arts or performing arts. He shows up to events and talks enthusiastically about what the arts not only means for him, but for the community. And so with that, I'll introduce Mayor Frank Scott. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. And hello, I'm Mayor Frank Scott Jr. Congratulations to the Arkansas Arts Center on the opening of its 62nd annual Delta exhibition one of the longest running and most prestigious art exhibitions in the region. This exhibition continues the Art Center's commitment to artists who live and work in our community. While it's virtual this year, viewers of the exhibition will still have a chance to see diverse points of view through engaging art experiences. Now more than ever, it is critical to see and hear from people with varied perspectives. Art is a unifier something that can bring groups together and help break down barriers to address difficult and at times horrific situations like those that our country is facing right now. As a former performing artist myself, and yes, I am a former performing artist, I'm thrilled that Little Rock values how art, whether painted, spoken, played, or danced, adds to the quality of life of our city. The partnerships created to host the 2020 exhibition highlights this. I look forward to seeing the exhibition and again, congratulations to the artists selected at the Arkansas Arts Center for continuing this important tradition. Thank you so much and we appreciate you. Thank you, Mayor Scott. Before I introduce our next speakers, let me send a special message to the 348 artists who entered work in this year's exhibition. 
To those artists, whether your work is in the exhibition or not, I want to say thank you and keep going. Being an artist is not easy. Putting your ideas, your skill, and your work out in the world for scrutiny takes a certain amount of conviction and confidence that most of us just don't possess. But we are grateful that artists possess these characteristics and have the belief in their work and art to make a difference. We live in a complex world that seems to be getting even more complex with injustices, inequality, and clashes of ideas that can make it difficult for us to determine our own convictions and question our own beliefs. Navigating the world is challenging, but I have a solution. I ask that you turn to art. Artists have always helped us as a society make sense of the world, help us to see beauty, struggle, challenges, and the complexities of being human. If you think about it, think of a song that raises your spirits or a film that gave you new insight, or maybe you saw a work of art that helped you view the world in a new way. For these experiences, you can thank artists. And tonight, I thank the 348 who submitted work to the Delta exhibition. Your guideposts for the rest of us, and we need you now more than ever. And now it's my pleasure to introduce this year's guest juror. Every year, the Art Center looks far and wide for a juror who will come in, review every work of art that's submitted, and select work for the show. This year, we're pleased to welcome Stephanie Fetter, Executive Director of the Visual Arts Center of Richmond. Stephanie brings over 25 years of experience in visual art programming and has presented over 80 exhibitions. She's also an artist herself. Stephanie is joined by the Art Center's Chief Curator and Wingate Foundation Curator of Contemporary Craft, Brian Lane. Brian oversees all curatorial work at the Art Center and has served as curator for numerous Art Center exhibitions. Brian leads the team that will be moving the Art Center collection of 14,000 works to our new building and leads the team who will oversee the exhibition schedule and installation of the permanent collection. But he's decided to take a break from that and he's going to sit down with Stephanie and talk about the exhibition and talk about art today. St Stephanie, Brian. Well, thank you for those uh, introductions. Of course, we're pleased to have Stephanie Fetter, the guest juror for the 62nd annual Delta uh, in conversation with me tonight. Stephanie, welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me. The, the Delta is such a, um, a storied exhibition with the Art Center and, and one that is inextricably linked with our history. Um, had you been familiar with the Delta before we invited you to be the juror? I actually had. I, I have known a couple of curators who um, had been invited to juror in the past and it had been on my radar just following their work through it. So. Um, I had, and I um, am located in Richmond, Virginia, and I am particularly interested in artists working in the South. So, um, also had been um, notified of your work just just through my own research. So, so I had. So, which was why it was a tremendous honor to be asked to juror it. And our institutions are are very similar in some respects, in that we both have exhibition spaces and. We have art studios. For those who may not be familiar with your institution, just want to give a brief background about it. Absolutely. So I'm the executive director of the, of the Visual Arts Center of Richmond in Richmond, Virginia. And we're a 30,000 square foot space that is located in the fan. So very close to downtown in a historic neighborhood. Um, but we are primarily um, an art center that focuses on um, artist studio practice. So if you want to learn how to make it, we can teach you how. Um, we have every single type of visual media under the sun that you can imagine that we teach in our um, studios. We serve about 45,000 people a year. We also have an exhibition space and we do a lot of um, community partnerships 
giving free programming um, throughout the city for people to come into our studios and make art. Now, in addition to you being the director of the Art Center, you yourself are a practicing artist. And I guess one of the questions that I have is, how did both of those roles factor into your selection process? Into my selection process? Well, you know, I, um, so I have a studio undergraduate degree from the Art Institute of Chicago, um, a fabulous school, but I also have a graduate degree in arts administration. So I have um, one of those dual brains, which is, uh, sometimes rare <laughs> in the art world. Um, but what for me, it really, what I really enjoy is understanding um, an artist material process. So when I approach a, an artwork, I really want to investigate how it's made. How did the artist make this? What materials did they use? That is it's really important in my own um, looking when I look at art I will be um, that person in the museum who is trying to get their head close to the wall to look behind a work to see <laughs> how, <laughs> how, how is this canvas wrapped and, and does the does the paint go all the way to the back and and is this hung on cleats you know I really I mean I love the whole object and understanding you know how an artwork came together and really thinking about the artist process from um, conception to realization. I'm not a maker, yet I appreciate those who do. And like you, um, I find myself doing the, many of the same things, um, but from the curatorial perspective and, you know, just how did they do that? Um, because I have a deep appreciation for those who, who have that creative talent. And I guess as a curator, um, I share some of that creative process through the way that an exhibition comes together. And this particular delta is unlike any other delta that we have ever presented in the 62 um, iterations. And, you know, we made the very difficult decision, um, though it was the right decision, to move to a virtual format. We know what this exhibition means to the artists who are chosen and to this region. And internally, and those with our community partners, the Thea Foundation, uh, the Argena Library, the Historic Arkansas Museum, and the Kansas Gallery. Um, this exhibition was literally going to um, encompass both the Little Rock and North Little Rock sides of, of the city. Um, and we felt that that was very important during um, this particular time in the institution's history is how can we deepen that engagement with the community? And, and this exhibition offered the, the perfect opportunity to do that. And then, of course, coronavirus hit. And, um, you know, we had invited you to be the juror nearly a year ago. And at that time, it was going to be a physical installation. It was going to be presented among the four venues. And then, as I said, in, um, I think it was March, uh, very early March, just as you were nearing the, the final selections, uh, we conversed with you and, and it switched to a, a virtual format. So, but knowing that, um, and trying to be mindful of how these works might have been hung had they been physically um, installed. How did the virtual format affect your, your decisions? Was it, was it liberating in that, um, you know, we were somewhat constrained by scale of the galleries and, and we said, no, you can choose, you know, whatever work you wanted. Um, or did you, did you stick true to that initial, um, would you have held true to that initial selection were it done in a physical format? I, you know, I, I, I thought about this and, and was asked this question previously, and I, I actually don't think that my selections would have varied much from what ended up in the final selection for the virtual exhibition. Now, when I did the final pass, obviously, you know, I knew that this exhibition was only going to live online and um, wanted to make sure that um, these images um, that would be, or these, you know, they're all objects that would be presented would really be able to stand alone. And something that I said in, in my statement, and, and, and I'd be curious to know how you feel about this, but, but really for me, one of the great joys of doing something like this is when, 
you see the works come together side by side in these and, and come together in um, various sites. And knowing that this was going to happen in various sites around um, the city was very exciting to me as well. And to think about, you know, how the context of those spaces would really inform how the works would finally be installed and come together. Um, you know, that's that's a bit of the heartbreak of this is that we we can't realize it that way. But the opportunity is to just go in with, you know, direct looking and say, what are the strongest works that I feel are relevant to this moment in time right now that will be resonant with people who are viewing these only online? Yeah. And you, 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 you viewed more than 700 works by 348 artists. And ultimately the 63 works were chosen by um, an equal number of artists. And in looking at those 63, naturally themes began to emerge. Um, and let's, let's, let's explore some of what those, those themes um, are. So this, this first slide, um, work by William Goodman um, from Mississippi and Anton Hoger from Texas. What, what struck me was the way two disparate artists presented similar material in an almost a, a very similar fashion with this layered technique of image um, and then um, surrounding iconography. Yeah, I responded immediately to um, both of these works and um, personally they felt very much like how we're moving right now through a news cycle you know, how we are layering information on top of, you know, new information, how it's changing, but we're, you know, sort of carrying these histories with us. Um, Anton's work is very much dealing with, you know, printed media, um, where William's work to me seems very much about um, iconography around space and place. Um, but for me, both of them together, just really, they felt really au courant just in terms of, you know, how we're all processing information. And um, both of these artists have done it with beauti beautifully um, rendered as well. So um, it's fun to see them come together side by side, even virtually. And yep. so you know, these are these are present concerns, and these artists are handling them. Um, you know, similarly, obviously, both with their own um, personal style, um, but in a way that I could personally relate to how I'm feeling in my head right now. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know that that um, almost like very naive drawing behind the woman with the red shoes is an interesting segue into the next work by Anais Dasse, um, who's an artist from, from Little Rock here. And she is originally from France, um, studied theatrical set design, and there's this very narrative quality, yet again, a very richly layered story um, in her work. And this is quite large, 48 by 77 inches. Um, so you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, I um, I was drawn to this work because it really felt like, I mean, obviously there's a lot of menace in um, this image, but also a moment of hope as well with this with this child who sort of is sweetly, and I'm going to pull it up on, on my screen, who is, um, you know, almost sweetly involved in this hunt with this, you know, this look on, on, on this child's face. Um, however, you know, understanding from the statement that the artist put forth that um, they really are trying to marry historical imagery with current topics that we are dealing with right now with, you know, how we're treating an immigrant population, how we deal with gun culture in America, um, but doing it through this, this sort of um, language of almost fable. So kind of writing, writing new histories um, in ways through their own artistic voice is, is what I took away from, from this moment um, and a way to really present, um, images that um, in a lot of ways are, are hard to look at and histories that are hard to deal with um, 
in a way that's approachable and you can really get in there and, and um, try to read that information. Also drawing inspiration from nature, we have, um, and, and being the curator of contemporary craft, I appreciate how much three-dimensional work you included in um, this year's exhibition. It's, it's much better represented than it, is in, than it has been in the past, but I also think it, it speaks to the submissions that were, that were entered. And um, by coincidence, both of these artists are from Little Rock as well. Deidre Blackwell, who works in metal, and Elizabeth Weber, who originally, um, you know, was principally a painter, but then had this whole new shift in her work. But, but both draw inspiration from nature. You have the, the hardness of the metal on the left and, the, and the, the softness of the work on the right. And both are, express, um, both are exploring um, the vessel form. Um, I love these works side by side, and I really, um, because this exhibition, um, for those who don't know, is juried blind, I don't have any information about the artists when, um, when I was going in to look, I was simply looking at the images and the objects, um, and also have um, a very strong interest in background and craft, which would make sense, but amazing submissions. Um, to the Delta in 3D with these 3D objects and um, some craft-based objects, which I think also really speaks to the region, which is very exciting for me to see. Um, but this, this really goes back to your first question about um, approach as an artist and thinking about um, the kind of signifiers that materials have in terms of um, an ar artist decision in making these objects. And I just, I love the way, um, Elizabeth Weber describes her, her uh, materials, leaf skeletons, honey locust thorns, wool roving, and dandelion wishes. That idea of, you know, the material you, you can, you know, you can purchase a canvas and you can paint on it, but um, to really make that intention to name your materials dandelion wishes, there is, um, there's a lot of extra information that gets embedded in the materials that artists choose. And I, I love to think about those ideas and to think about something that is so hard, tough and sustainable like brass and co copper in Deirdre's work, making these very delicate, what would be in real life ephemeral objects that would blow away um, or that will deteriorate and to make them permanent with um, this material that's going to sustain. I think it really, um, I think it also speaks to, to what we're made of as well. So um, I, I, it's, as we talk about the objects actually are coming together and creating these really, really fun and I think interesting conversations. So I appreciate seeing these two side by side and, and also with Elizabeth, this um, very delicate object sitting so gingerly in this precariously on on those thorns yeah exactly this dangerous terrain um is i think a a really um beautiful metaphor to how we're navigating the world right now and how um some of us might be feeling both internally and externally in the world right now <laughs> yes that's that's very well said and and while it's hard to to see i mean you look down into that um, that vessel for him, and you see those those dandelion wishes, um, and can just imagine them being released into the air, um, reflecting the hopes and, and aspirations of the the wisher. Absolutely, this is this work is um, essentially a poem. It's really really beautiful. Yeah. Um, also drawn from nature, we have these two photographs um, by Johnny Farrell and Robbie Brindley again, both of whom are, are from Arkansas. Um, you have the, the quiet, almost poetic, contemplative landscape that really one could encounter anywhere across the United States, but, but specifically here in the Delta. And then you have this, this awesome menace of a, of a storm, this sublime beauty um, of this storm uh, sweeping across the Delta region. Well, I am a um, lifetime road tripper, and I have spent a lot of time driving through Southern landscapes and driving around the US. That is, that is how I personally um, 
both escape and connect. Um, so what's interesting about these side by side is, is sort of how the artist decides um, where they decide to create their vantage point, how close and how far we pull back, um, you know, and not to not to make everything about this moment, but I, I really think that, um, you know, as I looked at these images, um, that felt very sort of very real to me and, and really thinking about, you know, how are we looking at our world um, both with softness, but with, you know, a, a real eye towards what Robbie's showing here, you know, what, what, how, how do we potentially see what's on the horizon here? Yeah. And then in almost a stark contrast, you come to the, the kind of solitary works of both Jed Jackson and John Lasseter. Um, I thought this was an interesting pairing, um, both deeply narrative. You don't know what the story is behind Blue Surfer. Um, and then you have the, the promise of, of summer um, with this figure on the right. Absolutely. And I think, I think with both of them, and as I went back and looked, you know, at, looked at these again, um, there, there are also in both of them kind of ghosts and relics of, you know, some other, some other things that may have happened or are hoped to happen. So there's um, an angel figure in the window of John Lasseter's piece and, a, and kind of a ghostly cat running across the, the carpet there down to the left. Um, and you're not, you know, you're not quite sure um, the anguish that, um, that that's what I read. Um, or maybe she's just tired. Or maybe she got a sunburn <laughs> of, of Jed Jackson's piece. Mm -hmm. But um, but that real, that, that sort of, um, those kind of deeply interior private spaces um, where, you know, we were finding ourselves very solitary when we were, you know, asked to social distance. But in both of these cases, there are these um, considered rendered exteriors, these spaces outside that um, neither of the figures are really looking out onto. They're really, they're really focused inward on themselves and in kind of what is happening in their own personal moment. And um, I mean, I can tell you personally, I have sat in a chair the same way this figure in John Lasseter's <laughs> sat, just kind of staring into space and really spending that time with ourselves right now to, I think, be, um, you know, as we have no choice but to slow down, to be much more, you know, contemplative about ourselves and our world, and um, they just resonated with me. And 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 they're not the only ones. There's there's you and I talk. There's a lot of um, selections of um, solitary figures. Some looking directly at you in the camera, which is also very hopeful. You know, looking at you through um, you know the lens of the cam uh, the camera or the canvas. Um, but in this case right here, um, I think it would be really hard for anyone to look at these and not find some place to relate. Yeah. Well, the climate has changed considerably even you know, in the last week, much less day to day. And in stark contrast to the works that we, we just viewed, one of the most powerful paintings and, and images I felt in the exhibition is this painting by Ajamu Kojo. Um, it's, it's a very complex work, both in its technical approach, but also in its contemporary relevance. Right. As you can see on the left, he draws his inspiration from this um, powerful photograph by Will Counts, uh, which we have in the Arkansas Art Center collection, documenting um, the integration of um, Central High School by the Little Rock Nine. And you see in the foreground Elizabeth Eckford, who uh, is, is walking toward the school. Um, she had made her dress specifically for her first day of school. Um, and then you see the mob behind her um, shouting epithets um, for her courage to, to integrate. And then in the work by Kojo on the right, he, he cloaks her in a superhero costume, 
um, making reference to the Black Panther movie and the, the mythological land of, of Wakanda. Um, so it, it, it's still an image that, that is moving and again, more relevant um, at this moment in time. Absolutely. I mean, I, number one, um, really appreciate that you have this photograph in your collection and we're showing these side by side. Um, and I went back and looked at them um, for quite a long time, side by side. I mean, I, I did not have this Will Counts image in front of me when I was selecting the works. I was um, just looking at Ajumu's work, you know, on its own and um, really knew the narrative without having much more information than um, the work itself. Um, and it was so powerful. And, and one of the things um, that struck me as I looked at these two images in parallel um, is that um, Kojo almost, the, the crowd, which is so menacing and terrifying, in the actual photograph, um, the artist is, is either almost sympathetic or the figure of Elizabeth Eckford has so much power in the midst of this crowd wearing this, you know, incredible um, dress, carrying a spear, walking with intention and power um, that in my brain, this crowd almost became followers. And which is the moment where we should be right now. You know, where we are all across the country, um, especially in um, cities like Richmond, Virginia, are reckoning with our history in a way that um, it's hard. And it is um, also time. So this, uh, you know, this image was just immediately, you know, immediately without a doubt, um, I was so excited to see it. And I don't think either um, you or I or anyone viewing this exhibition could have known how the context of this piece of artwork would change so radically in five days, you know, okay. five to seven days. And to me, it just really speaks to um, the power of artistic voice, the artist's um, both, you know, they they show us the way into the future, and that is what this image, Wakanda Don't Cry, does for me. Yeah. Art is that lens, that mirror that, that holds itself up to society, and unless and until we as a society make meaningful change, um, sadly, we may continue to have images like this as, as um, difficult as they are. Right, right. Um, I will say that um, uh, Kojo has really imbued a power in this that exists, existed in the absolute moment, but, um, but beyond with um, not just, not just a document, um, but a, a moment for the future, a moment to push us forward really it's it's well beyond a document it tells us where we're going um and similarly don holder's uh work um exploring um the role that that historical monuments play in in suppressing um various peoples um black communist under the people under communist rule um and and being in richmond your institution is not too far from Monument Avenue, is it not? And no. you are well familiar with this narrative. Absolutely. Um, we sit about five blocks from the Lee Monument. Um, we have been, um, you know, very much um, a part of the conversation um, previously about, you know, there have been commissions and a lot of conversation. Um, we've been pushing for artists' voices to be a part of that conversation. Um, but we're at a moment now um, in our city where um, these monuments are scheduled to come down. And um, there's a relief because 
they are powerful, powerful monuments. The Lee Monument stands six stories tall. You go and you see it next to these majestic homes on Monument Avenue. Um, and you understand why the scale and um, the position of this monument mattered and it, it um, was not built for reverence. So we, um, we really are at a very exciting moment in the city of Richmond and I think across the country um, because these statues really have created a lot of pain in our community. Um, and we have a lot of work to do in our community and it will be really wonderful to focus on that work and not focus on um, the lost cause that these monuments are basically standing for. Without question. And, you know, there are many cities, not only in the South, but across the country who um, have this opportunity to really move forward and look to the future um, rather than the past. Right. And I, I mean, I want to be really clear as a person, person who lives in Richmond, Virginia, um, which its history is the capital of the Confederacy. Um, but we are not a city that believes that that's our future. And that's a, that is not how we live um, as artists. It's not how we live as innovators. It's not how we live as businesses. Um, that is, that's not um, what our community stands on. So um, these images are really important because they signal that that is exactly who we are and it's not. And we're excited to visually present ourselves in a new way. Um, and I think that this is, this is actually hopeful. I, I agree. I agree. Um, so also hopeful is um, the day when we might be able to return to some semblance of normalcy, whatever normalcy is at that point in time. And, um, you know, I couldn't help but think that in looking at all of the works that were that were chosen, that there was this sub theme of of signs that emerged. You know, going back to the first um, set of images, um, there were a variety of signs in, in each of those, and and you have the, the 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 realism of David Rose on the left, and and um, while it's hard to make out in the video in the, um, the the slide here, you have the the sign by Lewis Watts which is comprised of very tiny hashtags. Um, so again, this, this, the work on the right is, is one that would, um, could have been benefited from, from close observation, but um, in, the, in the online format, you'll be able to zoom in and, and see those hashtags. Yeah, I, um, what's really interesting um, about both of these works, and I, had to, I actually had to go back, and, and I think the idea of signage where, you know, um, if you move through the world, you're moving, you know, from building signs to billboards, um, to your phone, like, you know, all, all of our, and all the messaging that we are, you know, getting, you know, daily on our phones. And so um, this Lewis Watts piece to me, before I referred to um, the size of it, looked like a monumental work. Like I imagined this thing to be, um, you know, many feet wide and many feet tall, the scale of the, the actual object, um, which I think is, I, I think is both, um, I think it's a sort of interesting advantage of having this online because you can, you can kind of grow it to whatever scale it needs to be. Um, but obviously right now, um, how we are communicating has changed so much. And I mean, we were already in a moment of, of great change where we were, you know, spending so much time communicating through social media on our phone. Um, but it really, um, you know, it's sort of exacerbated over, over the past few months here, really how we use social media, how we're picking up the phone and talking to one another and what signals we can actually get in the world through signage. Honestly, like, are, are, you know, are you open? Are you closed? Are you serving from the curb? Are you, ser you know, I mean, all like, really, like, how do we, like, what was so normal in the past, like to let me run in and grab an iced tea, you know, comes, has to come with a lot of information in advance. And, and um, these signs and signals actually teach us how we move our body through space now and what, what, we're, what we can and can't do. And so, um, for me, I was thinking about that a lot and, and thought that um, 
it was really interesting that there were so many opportunities to actually um, select works that were, you know, that actually were reference those sorts of ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Lewis does work on a larger scale, but it, it's very impressive, as you know, to um, see how small scale this is, yeah. um, yet, yet made up of, of thousands, I'm sure, of hashtags. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that. I, I love that it feels so monumental in yeah. the scale of the work. Almost like an Ed Ruscha homage in some yeah. respect. Yeah, absolutely. And then also harkens back to what I said before, my, just my love of the road trip. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and, and, and that it's, it's interesting that you observe that because David Rose has this whole body of sculptural work, um, which has appeared in past deltas. Um, all of which are inspired by his love and, and respect for the open road. So you may not have known that yet um, you, you hit the nail on the head uh, exactly. I didn't know that, but that, uh, that, that makes me feel like I'm, I'm somewhat on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you mentioned on our phones, and of course we take a lot of photographs on our phones. Um, and I was particularly taken by these two works, um, by Leah Grant and Chastity Surratt, um, who are actually art students. And one of the, the greatest stories that I can tell about the Delta is when uh, George Dombeck, who is a, a very well-known um, painter here in Arkansas, particularly in watercolor, when he was a graduate student at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville, um, his work was chosen um, for the Delta that year over the work of his professors. And um, he, he, he credits the Delta for giving him the confidence to pursue art as a profession. And I, I do hope that these, these two students stick with art because I think they have a very, very promising future. Um, I, I was just, I love how, like the first two works we, we saw, um, these are just richly layered with meaning and um, how memory is um, comprised from those little snippets of, of each of our lives. And I think that's what Chastity Sir represents in, in the work on the right. Right. I, um, I went in, um, looked up all the artists and looked up these artists, these two in particular, and especially when I, I you know, knew we were going to be talking about them side by side and um, was really excited to know that that story that they are both very early in their um, visual arts careers, um, which is exciting, which is, is another, um, I think, great testament to the Delta and um, to selecting the works um, you know, without having all the full information about the artists and just going on the strength of the works. And, and both of these, um, I think also both in their process as well, um, Leah's being um, cyanotype and screen print, um, which is, you know, such a specific process using, um, you know, using almost like a photographic process to, to burn the image and then layering, I'm guessing on top with, um, screen print to just, you know, create, you know, sort of create sort of multi layers of information, but she's also been able to be very gestural in her work in almost a painterly way using, um, using techniques that are pretty technical, yeah. um, which I thought was just, just a really, um, she just has a really beautiful hand and sensibility to, um, create those images. And then, um, with Chastity using the cyanotype, which, absolutely um, speaks of, you know, nostalgia to me, this, you know, sort of, it, it brings you back to um, a moment in time. And um, I looked at these side by side and I, I was really sort of thinking of memory, but I was also thinking um, in Chastity's case is really being a much, uh, sort of a much more nostalgic image about fragmented history and, and sort of how we put our stories together. And Leah's more in her technical um, approach of really how we write a future. So that that for me is how I, I actually come to an artist's work and, and think about their decisions to use different processes and material. And for me, how it informs the message um, that I that I receive as a viewer and a person who's been involved in making. Yeah. 
And we've seen this resurgence in these historical um, photographic techniques. Um, now they're called non-traditional, I think, in, in academia. Um, but at the time, they were very traditional. I mean, film, um, actual film in cameras, and, and now things are moving digital. Um, but then you come to the, to the next work um, by Euphus Ruth, and, and, um, which is a, a wet, wet plate colloidian amber type, you know, a historic um, printing process that um, I think really, really gives a patina, um, so to speak, uh, to this, this landscape view. Right. This, I mean, both of these um, works together, um, you know, speak to something um, for me about time and how, um, you know, we uh, don't necessarily have the control over nature and our landscape that we think we do. Um, you know, that, that it is, um, it is an ongoing process, but in both of these, um, in both of these cases, the fact that, um, Euphus's work really is this in the field, um, technique where you have, um, I mean, it's, um, a pretty, um, rigorous multi-step process to, to make a wet plate, uh, photograph, you know, often happening out of, you know, the back of a car within a 15 minute time window where you're working with kind of, you know, a direct action in that space. Um, and yet capturing, you know, capturing a quiet moment, but one that's indicative of time really marching on, really just continuing to move through. Um, and that is, you know, Jeannie's work being titled Imminent um, just says it, says it all. And, you know, um, we deal with um, kudzu and we deal with, you know, all like all of these um, elements um, in our landscape that when we leave, we'll persist. And uh, both of these are, are um, beautiful representations of that and um, very poetic in um, the hand of both of these artists to tell that story. Yeah, and I just noticed the scale of Euphus Ruth's uh, photograph. It's, it's 12 by 20, so it's quite sizable Yeah. Um, in its scale. Yeah, I am. Um, I, am very curious um and and also one of um you know one of the heartbreaks of this is that i can't come to arkansas and meet these artists because that's really if you want to know my favorite thing like that's <laughs> that's my motivation in all of this um because i would love i would love to hear this process described and um hear how he made this work because it, it seems also like a feat of acrobatics yeah um well, I don't know if um, Euphus is one of the artists, but we do have a very robust um, slate of programs on the horizon during the run of the exhibition, which include um, digital tours with the artists um, in their studios or conversations with them. Um, so watch our website for, for more details there. Fantastic. Um, and you can attend virtually from, from Richmond. I mean- I love that. that and I can get all my people here to attend too, so. Yeah. Um, you know, I did not know what Zoom was before March. Um, and now hardly a day goes by when we're not either on a Zoom call or um, a Teams meeting through Microsoft. So um, it, it has been, um, it has been an ever changing landscape in a relatively short amount of time. Absolutely. And I think what, um, I've been um, most impressed with is um, the fact that we've adapted so quickly to this technology because we have never lost that desire to connect. Um, and we're finding ways not just to try to replicate what we've done before, but really trying to use this moment to find, to find new, new ways of connections. And, um, you know, I work in the arts, you work in the arts, but I fully believe that, you know, it's artists that will, will push us even further into this media and, and keep us connected. I agree. I agree. And um, like your institution, we're offering digital classes. Um, so if you weren't in a position to make it to the Art Center before to take a class, you can do one in the comfort of your own home or, or um, studio. So. Yes. Well, we come to the point in um, the evening where 
as much as they may have enjoyed listening to us, they would really appreciate to hear from you um, who the award winners are. So I will turn it over to you and um, let you announce the awards, beginning with the Contemporaries Award. Well, I am thrilled to be able to do this. Um, like I said, it, it has been such a pleasure to really spend time with all of these works and, and really the works that were not selected. Um, it gives me, um, a curator and somebody invested, you know, in the contemporary art scene, a way to be introduced to so many new amazing artists. This was no easy task, any of this, um, but a pleasure all the way. So thank you, Brian. And thank you to the Arkansas Art Center for allowing me to do this. It's been really a wonderful experience. And so with no further hesitation, I am excited to announce the different awardees. Um, and so the Contemporaries Award will go to Chris Hines. Shall we leave a moment for applause? Yes. <laughs> Congratulations, Chris. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful sculpture. Um, again, a work that I would just absolutely love to see in person and one day, one day I will. Um, the Delta Award, and there's two Delta Awards that um, I was um, honored to select. The first one goes to Anton Hoger. And the second Delta Award goes to Leah Grant. And congratulations. Guess, congratulations, artists. And I guess we will have a drum roll here. <laughs> can, well, can we I don't know if you can hear that, but I'm tapping on my desk. <laughs> we'll do a, a virtual <laughs> drum roll. Um, the Grand Award for the 62nd Delta exhibition goes to Aaron Calvert. Congratulations. Well done, well done. So again, thank you so much, Stephanie, for um, all of the thought and deliberation um, that you have invested in ensuring the continuity of the Delta through 62 years while managing your own institution through this very, very challenging time um, amidst tremendous change within our respective communities. It has been my pleasure. Um, it gives me um, great hope and absolutely lifts me up personally. And I hope this exhibition creates moments of connection for the audience who get to experience it online and hopefully get to experience these artists' works in person one day. Um, that is the power of this exhibition in this moment. So virtually or in person, it is my honor. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And, and without further ado, we'll turn it back over to Victoria. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Stephanie. We appreciate your thoughtful comments. And let me thank everybody for joining us. Uh, whether you're an Arkansas Art Center member, friend, or you're visiting with us afar, we're glad that you joined us. And again, be sure to check the programming tab of our website where you'll be able to see all of the artist talks and studio visits that we have planned. Thank you. Have a good evening.